What is up, everybody? Jeffrey Lyles. You are listening to a new installment of Lyles Movie Files. I'm talking about the box office and a few other Hollywood notes because there were so many things that I could not wait to talk about with the fellas. I just needed to talk about it with you all. First up, the box office numbers from this weekend have come out, and not surprisingly, Snake Eyes, Jaja Origins did not top the list. For me, as a G- basically a lifelong G.I. Joe fan, I think I've told you before, G.I. Joe was my first comic book. It's my second action figure toy line uh, on the 3-4 three, three, scale after Star Wars. Um, I mean, I watched the cartoon religiously, and anything with G.I. Joe perks my ears, my attention. I'm on it. When I saw that they were trying to do this G.I. Joe one more time, and maybe for the last time, because we've already had G.I. Joe Rise of Cobra kind of fail to make much of an impact at the box office. G.I. Joe Retaliation did okay, but it also didn't set the world on fire. So we took a little bit more time to put out a new G.I. Joe film. I thought Paramount Pictures just had the wrong approach on so many levels with this. First off, Snake Eyes doesn't talk. We don't need Snake Eyes' origin, and if you're going to do it, you've got to do it right. You can't just go, let's make all these sweeping changes so the people who like Snake Eyes, who like G.I. Joe, who are in love with Snake Eyes' backstory won't roll their eyes and go, what the heck were you guys thinking? That was a major problem with Snake Eyes' G.I. Joe origins. There are too many, what were you guys doing? I'm starting to think that Kevin Feige might be the luckiest person in the entire world because some executives at Paramount Pictures actually just were like, okay, that works. Do your thing. When he came up with this revolutionary concept of just making Iron Man a modern version of the comic book origin with Tony Stark. And then, okay, do this thing with Iron Man 2 and Hulk. And he just kept doing it until he got to Avengers. And bam, we have a new billion dollar franchise. For some reason, these production companies just want to mess around and fiddle and tinker and fix properties that don't need to be fixed. And there's so many red flags from the very first trailer, from the first announcement, basically, of Snake Eyes that I was worried about this one. I wanted, I mean, and there is a blueprint that Larry Hama, who writes the G.I. Joe comic books to this day, who did it from issue one back in the 80s, he set up a perfect origin story. So it's not one of these situations where we had to come up with something because the writer didn't even bother to do it. So Larry Hama basically set it up where Snake Eyes, Stalker, Storm Shadow were Vietnam vets during the war Storm Shadow strongly hinted to Snake Eyes, hey dude, I have an opening in my family business. You're my boy, you're my best friend. Come join up with us. I'll make you part of the business. Stalker's an outsider despite being with them for all these months, but they're all part of this crew. During a big fight, Storm Shadow is close and tight enough with Snake Eyes that after Snake Eyes gets shot up, He runs back out to go save him, and not only save him, but to go recapture this picture of Snake Eyes' twin sister. These are all things you could easily switch over to a new war and and make sense of with no problem. You know, you just set it in Afghanistan, and bam, you've got that origin. The next part of the story, the comic book origin, has Snake Eyes come back from Vietnam, And General Hawk has to break the news to him. Hey, your parents and your twin sister were killed in this tragic car accident. You're all alone. People don't really like the Vietnam War. So you're on your own. But he's not because he still has his best friend Tommy who said, hey, come out and join my family business. So then with nothing else to lose and with nothing else around... Snake Eyes joins up with Tommy and his family, the Rashikagi clan, and he decides to train to become a ninja. This is important because 
It's set up where Snake Eyes has all this potential rage. I mean, his family was killed. He just went through a war. If ever there was a case of massive PTSD, this was it. And so he learns these new techniques. He becomes a ninja. Then there's tragedy there. He and Storm Shadow are on the outs. And then he's like, what am I doing now? Because I have nothing left. So he goes and retreats off to the woods in a cabin. And then Hawk and Stalker are like, yeah, we're putting together this Joe team. You're one of the best who've ever done it. Let's put you on the squad. And then he's like, whatever, I'll join the team. Not that long after he starts up with them, another tragedy hits him. He is trying to rescue Scarlet, who's caught in this... She's trying to escape from the helicopter. Her parachute's caught on the straps and buckles or whatever. Snake Eyes goes to rescue her. This flame shoots through the helicopter, destroys his face, ruins his vocal cords, so he can't talk anymore. So he's got all this inner tor turmoil, this tragedy, and a perfect origin for a movie character. And if you just do that, you've got a movie that would be really entertaining, that would make people care about Snake Eyes, and you don't really have to have him talk. The film just went the other way. Let's have Snake Eyes kind of be this bad guy who decides to name himself after what happened to his father as he gets killed. It's just a mess. And as I'm watching it, I found Storm Shadow, Andrew Koji's character, far more sympathetic, far more the hero. The plot tries to do this quick shift like a Bret Hart Steve Austin thing where, okay, now you're supposed to start rooting for Snake Eyes. And I'm like, heck no. He's in the wrong the entire time. And this quick turn that you guys do with the last five minutes doesn't work for me. They throw in Scarlet because, hey, we want to tease you guys that we're going to get a, a G.I. Joe movie after all out of this. But the damage is way already done. And the only really cool thing about this movie is Baroness. And... Ursula Corbano is the actress who plays her, if I said her name correctly. She's great. She captures everything about Baroness that the character is in the comic books, the cartoon. She just does it perfectly. I wanted to see more of her. Samara Weaving is okay as Scarlet. I think the script is one of those situations where it just hinders her way more. Her outfit looked good as Scarlet, though. She fired a crossbow, so the bonus points for actually having some form iota of accuracy there. But yeah, it was it was just a mess, and it, I, you could see it coming. You could see this this box office disappointment coming through, and maybe the death toll for GI Joe on the big screen. Like I said before, I don't think that this has to be the end of GI Joe in a live action format. I really think the future of GI Joe should be on a TV basis. They've already got Paramount Pro, Paramount Plus. I think that's the avenue that they should go on. Make a G.I. Joe series. Forget all this franchise building. Make it a TV show where we have a season commitment of 12, 15 episodes. And do that. G.I. Joe is a perfect property for a TV show with a studio that's willing to put in a Jack Ryan type budget onto it or 24 I mean it, it, there's nothing that has to be that extravagant about it sure you could whip up some cool cobra gizmos and vehicles but you can work around it if you have to be budget conscious I mean you see a lot of the vehicles that the Joes operate in just in standard war movies now so it's not like oh wow how are we going to record this stuff it's basic stuff they can do it they can make it work Make it eight episodes if it's too much for the budget. But you can make G.I. Joe work. You just have to do G.I. Joe. You just can't go, oh, let's throw up all this random stuff and just ignore it. Make G.I. Joe, G.I. Joe. Because we see what happens. That is a $14 million total at the box office. You lose out to M. Night Shyamalan's latest movie. And I mean, M. Night Shyamalan is, is one of those directors, screenwriters who... Half the audience is like, yeah, he didn't have any magic anymore. I know what's going to happen. It's going to be some disappointing twist, and that's it. So if you can't beat out his movie with what should be a basic blockbuster action movie that in the summer is a no-brainer to get people to theaters, then what are you doing? So that was a big problem. And yeah, no more G.I. Joe movies seems to be the likely story now as a result of this failure 
to get the property right. I'm starting to feel like Kevin Feige just really benefited from people at Marvel Studios and Paramount Pictures just not screwing around and saying, let's fix everything that you come to us with this premise for Iron Man. They just let him do his thing, which is basically take the origin from 1963, modernize it for today's audiences, and back in 2008, which is kind of crazy to think a modern audience back in 2008 already, right? And just tell the story of Iron Man, and it works. And like I said, I don't understand why you made G.I. Joe so complicated, where it's like, well, all right, well, we got to do this, we got to do this, let's change this part of him. And let's give him a mask, a helmet, with a visor for no freaking reason at the end of the movie, just because that's what Snake Eyes wears. Awful. I'm so upset about this thing, if you couldn't tell. Yeah, but I mean, they, they should have done so much more with, with Snake Eyes. It could have been a great movie, it could have been a great franchise. I feel like there's so many G.I. Joe fans who could have walked Paramount through how to do a G.I. Joe movie, let alone a Snake Eyes solo standoff film. Anyway, enough about that, I think. <laughs> So, um, there are some other really weird, weird news that came up here today. So, if you've been a fan of CW verse slash Arrowverse, you know Matt Ryan has played John Constantine for years now. Uh, the show Constantine on NBC was good. It was really good for for whatever NBC reasons they decided. Eh. We're not gonna run with this thing. We don't support it. So, you know, the show got canceled after a really fun first season. But CW verse, the Arrowverse decided Ryan's great as Constantine. Let's find a way to keep him into the universe. So they brought him on to Arrow to help resurrect, <laughs> resurrect, um, Sarah, Dinah, Laurel, whatever. Laurel, when they decided, hey, let's bring back this character and ruin everything we've been doing here. So anyway, they brought him back. Then he started showing up on Legends of Tomorrow. But now, because, you know, DC doesn't understand anything of what they're doing, um, one of the executive producers confirmed that Matt Ryan will no longer play Constantine. He's going to have to play a new character, Dr. Gwen Davies, because there is going to be a Justice League Dark on HBO Max. And... J.J. Abrams is doing this Constantine reboot and it is going to feature a quote-unquote darker take on the character and will likely feature a person of color as the title character. So to accommodate this HBO Max version, the CW verse version of Constantine has to go away. Yeah, I'm going to give you a second to think that through because right now, at this very moment, Andy Machete is filming The Flash, and it is going to have Ben Affleck's version of Batman alongside Michael Keaton's version of Batman, which, if you are counting and paying attention, is two different versions of Batman in one movie. I know your head's exploding at the concept, and, and I can't wait till you see what happens with, when Marvel Studios tries this wacky concept of a multiverse and has three Spider-Men in their the next Spider-Man film. But for whatever reason, DC doesn't think that we are we are competent enough to make sense of having a TV Constantine and another version of Constantine on HBO Max. So we have to get rid of one of them. I don't understand these guys. I mean, they're literally doing what they are getting rid of in one thing. So it's like, it's too confusing to have the same character in two separate shows, but we can have the same character in one movie. Like, that doesn't make any sense. Like, if you're watching Legends of Tomorrow and Constantine's there, you're not going, wait a second, there's a Constantine on HBO Max, and he's not even a white guy with blonde hair, like the comic book version. What's happening? This doesn't make any sense. You're not doing that. I mean, DC is the home of the multiverse. I don't understand how we're about to watch Marvel Studios just snatch the concept of the multiverse and do it better than DC's properties. Like that is blowing my mind. Way more than how Captain Marvel and Shazam were the same character. And then Marvel went and snatched Captain Marvel up and now Captain Marvel is uh you know <laughs> Brie Larson, her character, Carol Danvers, and 
Shazam has to just be the superhero with the lightning bolt. I mean, it's, it's not even the same name. They are about to do the same deal with this multiverse deal where people, the mainstream audience, are going to think DC is ripping off Marvel for coming up with multiple worlds and multiple Earths. That's about to blow my mind. But the reason is because DC is screwing it up. They can't even stay consistent with what they want to do with this deal. I don't understand this point whatsoever. And I, you know, I've not watched Legends so far this season. I kind of want more superheroes on this show. I'm kind of getting leery and tired of watching all the cool heroes characters leave. Like Adam had to get kicked off the show. Uh, Dominic Purcell's Heat Wave is leaving this season. So I mean, it's just like, eh. I'm a, I'm kind of out of it. It's kind of I'm kind of over Legends, but I don't think this does Legends any great favors to have another comic book character taken off. I mean, it's literally going to be these random characters who don't even have powers anymore, and they're just going around screwing up time. But that's a problem, and they really, really, really need to just understand that people can figure all this stuff out. Last stuff on this one, um, the Flash is filming and Ben Affleck is on set and he's getting ready so we're all ready to see what this is going to look like because apparently in the movie world we can handle the concept of a multiverse Black Widow is there we've got the announcement now in terms of when it's coming out on digital and blu-ray now this is kind of tricky because I don't think the film is set to come out you know for standard regular release on Disney Plus until October but it is coming out on digital on August 10th. And then you can get the 4K Ultra HD, Blu-ray, and DVD on September 14th. Which means if you have been waiting, you really don't have to wait too much longer to have it as part of your collection. And it's got nine deleted scenes. So that's a pretty nice set of extras. I don't think there is even a 3D version of this film for me to go look overseas to get the 3D version of it. So that's going to be disappointing. I got Far From Home's 3D you know, through overseas, definitely did the same for Endgame, but I don't think that possibility even exists now for Black Widow, which is really disappointing for me, because I, I still happily enlist my Blu-rays with 3Ds, so I can watch it on my TV, because I like the sensation of them coming out on screen at me. All right, so that's it for this episode. Like I said, I just want to talk about this real quick, just kind of go off one more time on why... Paramount Pictures dropped the ball so mightily on a Snake Eyes movie and and now we're all surprised that it didn't do well at the box office. I know, right? Alright, so we'll be back. I will probably do another episode featuring the other figure reveals from this past weekend. I may wait until later on Wednesday just so I can include the Marvel stuff, but we'll see. But for now, thanks for tuning in. This episode of Lyle's Movie Files has been filed. <laughs>